Dianne Feinstein returned to the Senate floor yesterday afternoon and cast her first two votes since February after the absence she took due to health issues. When she arrived at Capitol Hill, she was helped into a wheelchair and met by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. According to NBC, Feinstein told reporters she feels much better, but did not answer when asked about why she decided to return or to respond to calls from critics to resign. Intercept reporter Ken Klippenstein took to Twitter yesterday and said, all right, it's time to name and shame Dianne Feinstein's staff, all of whom should be blacklisted from politics forever for caring so little about their country that they refuse to resign. Adam Russell, press secretary, paid 102000 Alec uh, Bartashevich, legislative aide, 73000 Candace Hall, constituent correspondence director, 85000 Tammy Pham, legislative correspondent, Will Kink, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so on, uh, you know, reading off all all of these uh, names of the various people who have worked for her. And, okay, look, I don't, I, I respect Ken. I think he's a great journalist. We've had him on a lot. And I don't really, I don't care necessarily about the feelings of the staffers, but I also think this, this is totally counterproductive. I, I don't see what this accomplishes. It's not the staffer's fault that she won't resign, obviously. Like, that's her call. Um, I, I don't. I don't see what responsibility they bear to like. They should all quit in protest. Then other people would work for well, her. I don't think. Interesting that you should bring up. Should they quit in protest? Because Political came out with the story today um, about one of her staffers who did exactly that. Uh, a young man named Jamarcus Purely, who the article talks about, was working for Feinstein, who was concerned. You know, was driven into politics and really galvanized by things like um, the 2020 protests and Black Lives matter and thinking about his own life growing up in Flint, Michigan, and the own lack of resources that he had had, and then looking and contrasting that with the kind of priorities that he was seeing in Congress generally, but more specifically in Dianne Feinstein's office. And uh, in this piece, they explained that he made the choice to quit exactly like that, to walk out and before he left, hilariously or inappropriately, depending on your take, taking a picture of himself uh, smoking a joint. I mean, good for him. It accomplishes absolutely nothing, so. Well, because it's just one person. But isn't that the whole point of movies like Spartacus and protest movements and, and, and strikes and all of the things that have caused change to happen over the course of human history? That if people were to stand together, if, the, if her staff were to have come out and said, United, she is not actually fit for office a long time ago, then we might, the, the, the Democrats might not be in the situation they're in right now. No? I don't think the staff was ever going to accomplish that. I, I think she's intended to. St I mean, they could, you could have had Chuck Schumer put some pressure on her to get out of there instead of you know greeting her at the steps. And we should talk about those pictures of her. Look, it, it just it feels like elder abuse to me. It, it she looks like she's in terrible shape, pain possibly. Um, I, I feel very bad for her. It, it's not, there's nothing dignified about dragging a very old person, old woman around like this. Yeah. Clearly not capable of doing the job. Um, and, and this was this was almost being framed as some moment of triumph for her or something. It's sickening to me. Yeah, absolutely sickening. Well, so this this guy who he actually was let go, not not quit, but pure after this kind of protest. But purely what he said, Jamarcus was that here's from Politico. Uh, he thought he was being punished for telling hard truths about Feinstein. It was obvious to him that her mental faculties were dimming and that she might be going senile. He also had some more substantive uh, political concerns here. Um, but he he said he talked uh, he had talked about um, he talked about this with others in the office. The chief of staff seemed to be operating as a shadow senator since the actual one was, in his opinion, right. no longer mentally there. I mean, at a certain point, when do you, as an employee, become complicit? In this kind of dereliction of responsibility, I, you know, I, I can. I mean, I the dereliction of responsibility is, is hers. She should resign. She should get out of there. So you don't think that there's any kind of whistleblower obligation at any point for anybody who's so? No, close no. To I'm it. glad they, the staff, if they've done that, have communicated to the press um, that what the situation is. I just don't think demanding they all resign is going to come. They could all resign. Well, it's not demanding they all place. resign. It's putting their numbers, their public officials, putting their numbers up on Twitter so that people can call and pressure them to either talk to the press or I mean, create Ken internal said, like, pressure. They should never work. Again, I don't care about them, but he said like they should never work in politics again. It seemed excessively mean to me. Okay, but. maybe. I, I think that uh, maybe it was Ryan Graham who took the position that maybe the lower level staffers should have less scrutiny on them than more senior staffers. And I think that's a reasonable line to take. But look, we sit in a country where we talk constantly 
in hyperbolic terms about the exigency of every situation. People either think that immigration is a crisis or climate is a crisis or, um, you know, inflation is a crisis, uh, you know, police violence is a crisis, crime in the streets is a crisis, everything's a crisis. But the idea of picking up a phone and pressuring some staffers is a bridge too far in the way of making any change. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, that tension has to be resolved. Environment's a crisis, but God forbid someone throws soup at a painting that's covered up or block a road to well, try to like, get someone to pay well, attention. You know, like throwing, the, the, throwing the border soup is at a it, crisis. it's not going to do anything. The border is a crisis, but also we want to defund DHS. I mean, like, which, which is it going to be? And at a certain point, is it, it all about an outrage cycle without wanting to do anything that applies real leverage and pressure on any of the folks that have an ability to make a decision? But I don't think throwing soup at paintings actually does apply any real pressure. So do you think Blocking. that calling Diane Feinstein's office applies pressure, more pressure than sitting on Twitter saying— I didn't say don't call her office. I'm saying it doesn't— it, it's not going to improve the situation. It's not going to improve the business of the Senate. I mean, from a Democratic perspective, what they're upset about is she can't make it to votes, and like the whole business of the Senate operating is being thwarted by her obstinacy. The staffers leaving would not that would gum up the works Wait, even more, and they'd eventually be replaced. But, but the argument, you know, uh, the the argument is not that the staffers should resign specifically. Is what I understood is that you should be applying pressure and whatever whatever mechanism. It's like it's the ask is not specified here, so it's not that you guys should all. I mean, I, he, I don't know if he was asking them to do anything. He was saying they should all they should never work on Capitol Hill again. Well, I think again, I don't really care, but yeah, I mean, I I, I don't know that that is. Mm -hmm. exactly what the goal should be here, exactly. But I do think that putting names and faces on the people who are doing harm to the public is important. You, If you're a public official, that there might be a line somewhere where but you're I think, not I so think the facing. only people who are going to make her go were Democratic leadership in Congress. That might be true. But then maybe there is a case for her staff actually all resigning. Because if she cannot get to her door they by herself— They should have staff and be like—I mean, they should have done this— Months, long time ago, before it was too late to do any kind of replacing, and said, she is not good. She cannot. We can't keep up this farce. <laughs> but it sounds like there have been people who've been saying that for years. Whistleblowers for years. Or years ago, there were articles being written about her cognitive abilities. Years ago, there was a, an article written about some doctor who had said that she had been prescribed some medication mm -hmm. that indicated that there was some um, cognitive impairment. Years and years and years ago, and that hasn't had any effect. And so, I, while I appreciate, like, what did, what did AOC said? It always gets thrown back on her face that like protests are ugly. It's supposed to be uncomfortable, and then she turns around and complains about the discomfort that happens to her. But I mean, I think that that first observation is right. And and folks who are like, you know, the the expression of frustration at the Capitol on one six was a legitimate expression, even though the law shouldn't have been violated. People who say the expression of protest in the street over 2020 was a legitimate expression of frustration. MLK saying that violence uh, in protest riots are the language of the unheard. There's something true about all of that. Yeah, and I, I take just a much hard time dimmer so worked view up of about protests having any kind of effect on anything, but <laughs> you do, I guess. Protests have never had an effect on anything. I didn't it, say they've never had an effect. I said I take a dim review on them having a. So sometimes protests work. Invariably, I'm sure there are examples. Yes. Okay, I think that we could put our heads together. Usually, and come up with an example a bunch of stuff. Of protests working. Set some things on fire. Then like goes I don't back know, the normal. founding of America and the Boston Tea Party and the Revolutionary War. I mean, I think it could come up between the two. Of a couple of examples of protests working. All I'm saying is, I I don't have a lot of energy to be critical of Ken's move when all that's being asked in this moment is like this de minimis call your senator kind I mean, of it campaign. It doesn't make a list of the top thousand things that really bugged me in the last 24 hours, but <laughs> we're talking about it. So all just right, giving us, you my take. <laughs> let us know what you think. Do you think that Ken has gone too far? Do you think congressional staffers uh, should be kind of publicly harangued in this way? Is there a line that you would draw between what kind of staffers deserve this kind of pointed criticism from the likes of intrepid uh, reporter Ken Klippenstein? Let us know in the comments. We'll have more rising for you right after this.